sit and go and grab the pot. Yeah, and see if I can grab one. Okay. That's perfect. That's the Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, so it's a very good job that we have a talk that's well worth waiting for. <laughs> so now we're going to have it. So today, uh, eventually, now we welcome Joseph Ortiz, who is a professor in the Department of Geology at Kent State University. He has a BS in Aquatic Biology from Brown University and a PhD in Oceanography from Oregon State University. He's a fellow of the Geological Society of America. His research focuses on paleoclimate change and water quality, particularly in the Great Lakes and Lake Erie. He works at the interface between sciences, solving climate mysteries, and helping to improve water quality. Quite a mix, using electromagnetic sensing techniques. His topic today is an historical one. And he tells us about Eunice Foot, carbon dioxide, atmospheric warming and climate, a once forgotten climate science pioneer. Sure. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, that warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking at Case University in front of the, the physics department. And uh, I think that, that this really typifies what I try to strive for in my science, uh, which is to work at the interface between different scientific fields. And uh, with time, I can say also that, uh, that my interests have become more physical in, uh, in their development. I started out interested in the aquatic uh, uh, biology as an undergrad and wanting to do work in the intertidal zone. And uh, when I went to Brown University, I had the the honor and pleasure of meeting uh, John Embry, who is called the, the father of paleoclimatology and, um, and a champion of the Milankovitch hypothesis or the Kroll Milankovitch hypothesis, which stipulates that Earth's climate on uh, long time scales from 400,000 years to 20,000 years is driven by orbital variation. And so one of the things that, that, uh, that intrigued me with that was understanding how the physical properties influence uh, the Earth's climate system. And uh, while I was at Brown, uh, they imbued us with, uh, uh, with an interest in understanding the history of science. And uh, as an undergrad, I had been very interested in, in uh, uh, science, in history and computer science. And I was trying to decide which of those areas I wanted to go into. And what I found really exciting and, and fascinating at Brown was that by studying paleoclimate, I could uh, learn a little bit about the history of science, apply my uh, research to, uh, to understanding uh, ancient worlds and uh, to make use of uh, computers and statistical analyses in order to pull out information about the climate system. And so for me, that was a way of merging all of those, those interests. But what I'm gonna talk about today is, uh, is Eunice Foote. And so I'll, I'll introduce you to, uh, to Eunice Foote and who she was, the importance of the role that she played in our understanding of climate science. Uh, there are uh, those of us who like to prefer, uh, refer to her as the mother of, of uh, climate science. And I'll start out with, uh, with a basic introduction to, to climate science uh, and the, the basics of, of climate. And I apologize if that's at a level that's uh, too low for, uh, for this group. Uh, but it, I, I think it's useful to try and provide a little bit of background information. So that's about half of what we're going to talk about. And then we'll get into the details of uh, Eunice Foote's work. And so I published this paper in Notes and Records in 2020 at the beginning of the, uh, of the pandemic uh, with, with Roland Jackson. And people have asked me, how, did, how is it that I came to learn about Eunice Foote and, uh, and this research? And uh, the answer to that is, is kind of convoluted, but there was a, a faculty member at Kent State who was a chemical geologist, and uh, she introduced me to, uh, to Eunice Foote. This was uh, Liz Griffith, who is now a professor at, um, at Ohio State University. And uh, she mentioned that there was this scientist who had done some, some research on uh, CO2 in, um, in the 1800s. And I thought that was really interesting. And I asked her to, to share a copy of that paper with me. 
and, uh, and, and uh, looked into that and started reading and was really intrigued by what uh, Eunice Foote had, had done at such time and played around with the science a little bit. And when I saw the results at first, I said, you know, this is interesting, but if I try to publish this, no one's gonna believe it. And uh, no one's gonna listen to me because of the, the state that we're in, in terms of, of uh, a cl modern climate denial and science denial. And I, I set it aside for a little while. And then uh, later on Twitter, I ran into another climate scientist who I know, uh, Sarah Myrie. And Sarah posted a, a tweet that said, who was that uh, a woman a scientist who discovered the greenhouse effect? And someone responded, oh, that was, that was Eunice, Eunice and Newton Foote, Eunice Foote. And a Twitter war erupted. With, uh, with people saying, no, that can't be, there's no way, there's no truth to that, don't listen to that, and so on. And uh, I kind of sheepishly tweeted something back about how actually I've looked at her data and, and think that there's really quite something to that claim. And one of the people who responded was, was Roland Jackson, who said, I'd be very interested to, to see that, you know, can we talk about that? And he was, he was cordial and, and reasonable in his response. And so I thought he wasn't just baiting me. And so I did take him up on that offer. And we started communicating um, by DM. And it turned out, I, I, at one point I asked him uh, unknowingly, so you must be a historian of science. And, and he kind of said uh, very politely, well, yes, I, I suppose you could say that. Well, it turns out that Roland Jackson is Sir Roland Jackson. He's a member of the Royal Society and the biographer for James Tyndale. And he had just written a, uh, a paper on, uh, on the comparison between Eunice Foote and uh, John Tyndale and their relative uh, contributions to early climate science. Uh, and he was working on a, a, a book that came out about the, uh, the history of, of John Tyndale's uh, research and interest. And so we got to talking and realized that uh, we were both very interested in this topic and with um, uh, working with, with uh, a scholar of his, uh, his degree, I, I, I decided that it was worth time to to take a stab at, at writing this paper. And so uh, working in, in shifts, I would work uh, uh, on my time, he would work on the others. And we, we put together this paper in about 10 days and, uh, and did some additional work on it and sent it off and it was accepted in uh, Notes and Record, which is the, uh, uh, the science, uh, the History of Science Journal of the Royal Society. And so that's the background on, on how this paper came about. And it doesn't want to advance. Excuse me, I'm using a, a borrowed computer here. Yeah, I think it should be advancing now. It's temporarily okay. frozen. But... Okay. So, um, so just as I, I, I said, we're going to have a little bit of a, a quick basics on on climate. And so, in a very simple-minded way, we can think of of uh, the climate story is one of the redistribution of heat uh, on Earth. And so we have an excess of heat coming in at the low latitudes and we have a, a deficit of heat at the lat high latitudes and climate is the process of the redistribution of that heat from the low latitudes to the high latitudes uh, through a number of different uh, physical mechanisms. So through uh, atmospheric circulation and ocean circulation and the movement of, of storms in the atmosphere. Uh, and of course, climate is the, the long-term average of, of weather uh, defined as a 30-year uh, average window. And so where are we at now in our current climate and how do we get here? So if we uh, look at this plot, this is a, a recent uh, plot for the, the Keeling curve. The Keeling curve is the measure of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere at the Mauna Loa uh, site uh, that was started by, uh, by Charles and, and Ralph Keeling. And what we can see is currently, as of June, the maxima was about 419 parts per million. If you look on the screen, you can see perhaps a tiny red dot uh, that's set at 1985. And that's the Keeling curve when I first saw it as an undergrad at Brown University. And if we go back and uh, look at the, uh, the little yellow dot in 1966, that's what the amount of CO2 was in the atmosphere at the time that I was born. Uh, so you can see how far we've moved since then. And if you go back down to the, the blue dot, which doesn't even plot on the scale at 280 parts per million, that's the amount of CO2 that was in the atmosphere uh, before human activity started modifying 
uh, the amount of CO2 that was there, what we refer to as the pre-anthropogenic CO2 value. And so just to give you an idea, I have to update this plot every time that I uh, teach a course. And so I updated it uh, most recently in January of 2021 when the value was 415. And, uh, and then again for this talk at 419. So the rate at which it's increasing is about 1.65 uh, parts per million per year. Uh, when I was a graduate student back in the, uh, the 1980s, 1990s, the rate at which it was increasing was much lower than that, more like uh, one uh, part per million per year, right? So the rate of, at which CO2 is being put into the atmosphere is accelerating. If we go back to the time of Eunice Foote, 1856, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere would have been about 286 ppm uh, based on ice core records. And if we go even farther back in time and start looking at Milankovitch cycles, right? So now over the last 800,000 years, what we see is that during uh, glacial time periods, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere would have been about 180 parts per million. During um, interglacials, the amount of CO2 would have been about 280 ppm. And of course, now we're at uh, 419. So the difference over the last uh, 200 or so years, 150 years or so, has been uh, on the order of 140 ppm. So larger than uh, a natural glacial interglacial change in CO2 of about 100 ppm. And of course, this has driven uh, the warming that we're observing today. So uh, this is from the IPCC AR6 report. And what's shown is the contribution of the various uh, sources, both natural and anthropogenic uh, that have been driven. And so we're currently at about 1.1 degrees C warming uh, above uh, the long-term average uh, mean. The majority of that warming is driven by CO2 and by methane, right? And it's balanced by a cooling due to uh, sulfate aerosols in the atmosphere. Right, so sulfate aerosols in the atmosphere cool the, the planet by reflecting light away from the surface by raising the surface albedo of the planet, or at least the atmospheric albedo of the planet. And uh, they're produced as a, a byproduct of the um, industrial burning of, of fossil fuels. Right, so if you talk to Jim Hansen, the, uh, uh, the famous climate modeler, uh, he wrote a paper in the, the 1990s that he called the Faustian bargain in which we were masking some of the warming that was occurring through uh, the uh, pollution generated by sulfate aerosols. Well, what's happened in the intervening uh, uh, decades is we have cleaned up the pollution generated by uh, fossil fuel burning by scrubbing out sulfates from, uh, from smokestacks, which is a good thing because it limits the amount of, uh, of acid rain that occurs on the planet. Uh, but a negative consequence of that is that now the full force of the greenhouse warming due to CO2 and methane is, uh, is uh, coming into effect. And so we're paying that Faustian bargain now uh, is what he said. And in fact, it's not us who are paying it or who will be paying it, but our children and our, our grandchildren. So that's the, the state of where we're at. And if we look at the, uh, uh, the, the temperature change, uh, what we see is that the, um, uh, the temperature of the planet was relatively steady. It was at, uh, essentially uh, a steady state with a gradual cooling over the last 2000 years due to changes in the orbital geometry of our, of our, our planet. And then we have the industrial revolution and the transition to uh, much greater warming driven by uh, the conditions that we just talked about, the burning of fossil fuels, changes in land use and uh, cement production, for example. And uh, simulations of climate or, or climate models have demonstrated that the only way that we can fit that is when we add in those anthropogenic forcings, right? In the absence of anthropogenic forcing, we get the, the green line uh, for a comparison, which I can show here with the, the pointer that the folks in the room can see. In the presence of the anthropogenic forcing, we can reconstruct the, um, the climate record, the observed climate record. Okay. And so our understanding, uh, one, one point to make here, again, at the beginning of this record, we, I pointed out 1856. So that's when Eunice Foote walked the earth and was, was doing her science, right? And we're gonna learn what that science is shortly. 
And so our, our understanding and ability to model the climate system has improved uh, dramatically in all that time. So uh, this chart, which is from the fourth uh, national climate assessment for the, uh, for the US, states that we had a, a firm understanding of radiative transfer by the 1890s. And what I will show you today, I hope, is that the beginnings of that dates back to the 1850s with the work of Eunice Foote. So of course, we're talking about the greenhouse effect. And so incoming solar radiation hits the surface of the planet and uh, some of it is absorbed, some of it is radiated back out as uh, long wave radiation, uh, much of which is lost to space, but some of it gets um, reabsorbed in the upper atmosphere as shown by the yellow circle and radiated back down to the, the earth, right? That's what we're talking about when we say the earth's natural uh, greenhouse effect, right? And uh, John Tyndale is credited with the first me direct measurement of uh, the Earth's uh, natural greenhouse effect using his instrumentation, which was able to separate out the short wave from the long wave radiation, right? Um, but uh, the basis for the, the greenhouse on a molecular scale is the absorption of incoming IR radiation by uh, molecules that can generate an asymmetric uh, response, either an asymmetric stretching or uh, rotation or, or through translation. And so uh, what's shown here is uh, a water vapor uh, molecule in the above and then uh, CO2 molecule uh, below. And so there is a molecular basis for the greenhouse effect, right? And that's important for our conversation. If we look at this uh, plot that shows the transmission of energy as a function of wavelength that goes from, um, from about 500 or 400 in the visible out to uh, 13 or 15 microns in the near infrared, uh, what we can see is the absorption of CO2, which occurs at, at three atmospheric windows, and also the absorption of water vapor, right? Water vapor absorbs over a broader range than CO2, uh, but water vapor does not remain in the atmosphere indefinitely, or at least for a long period of time, because it rains out as precipitation. And so as a result of that, water vapor can't control the Earth's greenhouse effect, right? It's in fact um, CO2, which provides the, the pacing for water, which varies and amplifies that. And so as a result of these differences in gases, we see that the Earth has a natural greenhouse effect of about 33 degrees. Um, uh, Mars, which has a, a, a thinner atmosphere, about 10 degrees, and Venus, a, a hellish warming of, of uh, 523 degrees Celsius. If we put together all of the characteristics that drive the variability in the climate system, we can come up with Earth's uh, climate sensitivity. And so uh, modeling studies place that sensitivity at somewhere between uh, four point, sorry, one point five uh, degrees C per doubling of forcing to 4.5 degrees C per doubling of forcing with the, the nominal value uh, somewhere around uh, 2.7 or, or three uh, degrees Celsius per doubling. Uh, what's shown here is a comparison of uh, the preanthropogenic case in gray and uh, the value from one of the earlier IPCC results in red. Um, and then the blue curves represent paleoceanographic data or paleoclimate data from ancient environments where they've estimated the, uh, the radiative forcing based on uh, Milankovitch uh, cyclicity, and they've estimated the, uh, the global temperature of the surface and come up with these responses. And what's remarkable about this is that the paleo data is quite consistent with the, uh, with the modeling studies uh, over this, uh, this linear range. So the numbers to keep in mind are, are something like 1.5 uh, to 4.5 degrees per doubling. Okay, so that's my, my very brief introduction to, to climate science. And it uh, provides us with the opportunity in the background to really appreciate the work that was done by Eunice Newton Foote. And so um, we can refer to Eunice Newton Foote as an American scientist, inventor, and women's rights advocate. Uh, but at the time that she was working, she, she did her work so early in our, our scientific advancement that the term scientist was not in, in common vogue at that time. Um, and 
rather than call her an, an amateur uh, scientist, as some people have referred to, it's probably better to refer to as an unaffiliated uh, scientist, right? Uh, because we don't want to put any pejorative terms on, on uh, what her capabilities were. Um, she was uh, also uh, a descendant of uh, Sir Isaac Newton, right? The great mathematician and physicist from, uh, from England. Uh, which is remarkable. And uh, in, in doing the research for this talk and previously, uh, it occurred to me that it's possible that she knew that she was a descendant of Isaac Newton. Her father was Isaac Newton Jr. And her grandfather was, was Isaac Newton. Now he wasn't the Isaac Newton, but clearly it was a family name that had been passed along, uh, probably written in the, in the family Bible that was passed from, um, from uh, descendant to descendant. And she was a, a distant cousin of, of Isaac Newton. She lived in upstate New York and she had the, the benefit of, um, of being wealthy enough that she could uh, attend schooling, even though she came from a large family. And so she went to a school known as the Troy Female Seminary, uh, which is still in operation today, but it's now known as the, uh, the Emmer, Will, Emmer, excuse me, Emma Willard School, uh, which is a boarding school for, uh, for uh, women. And at the time, she also was able to take science courses at the school that would eventually become Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And so she was versed in all of the fields of, of science and mathematics of her day uh, and was, was apparently very gifted at them. She was a, a, a star student. Her husband was uh, Judge Elijah Foote, who was also interested in science and invention. And so they had uh, worked together on a number of, of projects. Uh, they invented an oven. Uh, she worked on developing uh, a means of, of uh, making shoes that didn't squeak. And uh, she also uh, developed uh, several types of, of paper and a paper making machine as uh, part of her patents um, along those lines. Uh, Eunice Foote and uh, Elijah Foote also presented their work in scientific conferences. And so the work that's of interest here is, uh, was presented at the 10th and the 11th meetings of the AAAS meeting. Um, and uh, from that, several papers uh, arose. So the 1856 paper that we're gonna talk about today uh, by uh, Eunice Foote and an 1856 paper by, uh, by Judge uh, Elijah Foote and then an 1857 paper that Eunice Foote wrote. She was the sole author on the two papers that she wrote. They were single author papers. Her 1856 paper looked at um, the influence of different gases on uh, solar radiation on sun rays. The 1857 paper looked at uh, what she referred to as uh, atmospheric excitation, but what we would probably refer to as static electricity, and was interested in the relationship between static electricity and the Earth's magnetic field, among other uh, topics. It's notable that her 1857 paper in, uh, was the first paper published in the AAAS by a woman. And she was one of uh, only a handful of women who presented papers at meetings or, or had her work presented at, at meetings uh, before the, uh, the Civil War era. So I have here uh, two pictures. One is of uh, Elijah Foote and the other is of her daughter, uh, Mary New uh, Newton Foote. Unfortunately, there is no known picture of Eunice Foote. Uh, she is described as blonde of complexion, uh, but apparently uh, no photograph either sur uh, survived or, or was taken at the time that uh, she was doing her work. Her children went on to, uh, uh, to being uh, influential in their day as well. So, uh, so Mary uh, uh, Newton Henderson married the, uh, the senator from Missouri who introduced the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery. Um, her sister, uh, Augusta, was a, a, um, a member of the, the board at Barnard College, right? So uh, uh, influential individuals. And she was a, a writer of her own right. I mentioned that Eunice Foote was, uh, was a women's rights advocate. She was on the editorial committee. She was one of five women who wrote the report for the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, which is the first uh, convention that called for, for women's rights and the right to vote. Um, and so uh, here's her, her signature there. Uh, she was the fifth person to sign uh, Eunice Newton Foote, along with uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, Lucretia Mott. 
uh, her husband also signed uh, Elijah Foot, and below Elijah's foot is the signature of Frederick Douglass. Uh, to give you an idea of the of the people that they know knew and interacted with in their day, so they were were uh, the intelligentsia of of uh, of their era. So there are some other people that um, that will come up in the the conversation that we're looking at here. One of them was was uh, Professor Joseph Henry. He was the founding secretary of the Smithsonian Institution in 1856, and a contemporary of Eunice Foote. Uh, John Tyndale, as I mentioned before, is the iris uh, scientist who's uh, credited with the um, discovery of the Earth's natural greenhouse effect. David Ames Wells was a, a, a science writer. At the time, he wrote um, yearbooks that described scientific results. So he would read through the newspapers and, uh, and other descriptions of science and put together a, a, an almanac, if you will, that uh, would describe uh, the results that were done scientifically. And one of the things that I found when I was working on this paper was that uh, the proceedings of major scientific meetings were covered in detail in newspapers. So you could pick up the newspaper and you could read a description of every single talk in every single section of the AAAS meeting that was just published in the newspaper. That was in addition to the the proceedings that were published separately, right? So it would have been a very interesting time to be presenting uh, your science there. Franz Unger was uh, an Austrian botanist and geologist who wrote an early textbook, a folio textbook of, uh, of earth science that uh, uh, was a, a teamwork with uh, an artist in which the artist generated uh, reconstructions of these past worlds and Franz, uh, gave him the interpretation to generate those images. And so this would have been an early textbook that uh, Eunice Foote may have had access to. And then uh, Raymond Sorensen was a, a retired um, oil and gas um, uh, uh, engineer or employee who rediscovered Eunice's foot, uh, Foote's work uh, years later. So from there, we can go on to, uh, to a, a, an analysis of Eunice Foote's uh, research. So there's no known photographs of her. So here's an artist's rendition of her looking over her, her experimental setup, uh, which was a, a simple setup consisted of, of uh, two glass tubes with, um, with brass caps on the ends, one of which was attached to a spigot that could be attached to a pump to pump uh, gases out or to allow uh, materials in. And then the other had uh, a potted thermometer put through it so that she could measure the temperature. And this is her paper. Her entire paper is, uh, is a page and a half long, right? It sits on two pages. And it was published in the American Journal of Science and Arts in 1856 on the two page, on the pages that uh, immediately followed uh, the publication by her husband, which was looking at uh, con uh, a, a technique of concentrating solar energy, solar rays. And so uh, one of the things that intrigued me about uh, Eunice Foote when I read through, uh, through this paper was that uh, people had noted that she had observed that uh, the addition of CO2 to an atmosphere, which she referred to as carbonic acid or carbonic acid uh, vapor or carbonic acid gas, could cause that atmosphere to warm. But no one had tried to quantify or evaluate the results from her data. And so I went through and did it. Um, one of the things that I wanted to know was, was how good were her temperature measurements. And so in order to do that, we, uh, I fit the, uh, uh, the temperature series with uh, logarithmic fits, removed those logarithmic fits as a function of time, and then looked at the residuals of her, her shaded runs and found that the uncertainty, the three sigma uncertainty for those measurements was plus or minus one degree, which was actually quite good, right? And so the way she set up her experiment was with paired uh, controls, which I also thought was really elegant. And so she had those two tubes and she paired them, pairing uh, one tube in which she exhausted all of the air from it and then pumped it into a second uh, tube, which she called the condensed tube or compressed tube. And then she had a second one where she had dry air. So she opened the stopcock, let the uh, atmosphere in, and then she desiccated it using, uh, uh, car, uh, calcium carbonate, right? 
um, and then close the spigot. And in the, uh, the second one, she added water in order to saturate the, uh, uh, the air with uh, water, adding enough water so that she saw um, condensation uh, occurring. And then she had another one in which she compared what she referred to as common air with carbonic uh, acid vapor. And she doesn't detail in the paper how she generated the carbonic acid vapor, uh, but we can speculate, right? And so my speculation is that she probably added some, some uh, calcium carbonate and then dissolved it using hydrochloric acid or some other type of acid. It would have been the simplest thing to do. Um, and then she compared those results in those paired fashions. And she put the pairs of, um, of, uh, of the, the experiment out in the sun and let them warm up. And she also put them in the shade um, and measured the, the difference in temperature between the shaded pair and the, uh, the sun pair, and then uh, reported on the warming that had been occurred. And from this, she concluded that there were three results that she had observed. Uh, the first, was that the condensed air uh, was warmer than the, uh, the vacuum uh, tube that she had measured. The second was that the damp air uh, was warmer than the dry air. And the third was that the carbonic acid gas uh, tube was uh, much warmer than the common air sample. And so we can think about what the physics was that was occurring in, in, uh, in the tubes. And so this is my, my qualitative assessment of the, the boundary conditions that were occurring. And so she did these experiments outside. Uh, we don't know how she put them in the shade. She put, could have put them in the shade of a, of a tree, or she might've put them in the shade uh, of a building. And then the other was put in direct sunlight. And uh, while they were sitting there, on the outside of the container, the uh, wind would have been blowing uh, past these and, um, and creating convection that would be carrying heat away from the tubes. And of course, there would be convection inside of the tubes as well. And then in the tubes that were uh, particularly exposed to the sun, there would be shortwave uh, light that was transmitted through them, uh, which would not interact much with the, the gases there because of the uh, transmittability of, um, of the atmosphere with those wavelengths. Um, and the glass would have excluded much of the long wave radiation uh, because it's opaque in, in, in those um, areas. And that's a focus that people who have criticized her experiment have stated that all she did was she measured the absorption of, of short wave, which is not the greenhouse effect. But if the long wave radiation was excluded from entering the, uh, the vessels, then that must mean that it was also excluded from escaping the vessel. Right? If it can't pass through it, it can't pass out of it. And so what I take away from this is the last source of, of energy exchange would have been conductance through the walls. So the sunlight on the surface of the experiment would have wall, uh, heated the walls of the, um, of the vessel. Uh, that energy would have then uh, conducted into the interior of the gas. And um, in the process of generating uh, long wave radiation, that long wave radiation would have then been uh, captured by some of the gas within there and then re-radiated um, so that you would have um, eventually reached some kind of steady state. Now, in, of course, in her experiments, unfortunately, she didn't run the experiments long enough for them to reach steady state. We can see that because of the, uh, the curvature of the logarithmic fits. Um, but the reason that she probably saw differences between the different gases was because of the molecular basis of the greenhouse effect. Right. She states in her studies that, uh, that the highest temperature change she saw was with CO2 and with water vapor, both of which are greenhouse gases. She also tested hydrogen and oxygen um, and uh, gas and, uh, and, and the vacuum and did not see that kind of effect with, with those, those different conditions. And she, uh, she rightly explained the, the ranking from those and came up with some suggestions on that. So how was, was Eunice Foote's work received? Well, as I mentioned, Elijah Foote uh, wrote his paper and uh, was allowed to present it or uh, presented that at the 10th AAAS meeting in, in Albany, New York. Eunice Foote did not get to present either of the papers that she wrote. Uh, both of the papers, the 1856 paper and the 1857 paper 
were presented by Joseph Henry, the uh, secretary of the uh, Smithsonian. We know that for a fact because it's written on the, uh, the descriptions in the newspaper uh, that he presented the 1856 paper. Um, when the 1857 paper was written, it was written with uh, Eunice Foote's name in, in several different ways on it without any mention as to who read that paper. And so it was initially assumed that Eunice Foote uh, did read that paper uh, at the AAAS meeting. But unfortunately, uh, when we were doing our research, Roland and I discovered that in fact, the newspaper articles from, uh, from the Montreal meeting clearly state that uh, Joseph Henry presented both papers. So that was a, a new piece of information that we found as part of this research. And before the 1856 paper, Joseph Henry stated, science was of no country and of no sex. The sphere of women embraces not only the beautiful and the useful, but the true. And, and so that's how he started out his presentation then gave the presentation. And we'll come back later to what he said at the closing. Scientific American, just one month later in September, the meeting took place in August, published a glowing review of, of uh, Eunice Foote's work and also mentioned uh, the work of several other uh, women scientists. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. David Wells, that science writer that we mentioned, wrote an account of Eunice Foote's uh, work in 1857. And we found an additional account later that we'll, we'll talk about here as well. But what was surprising was that Elijah Foote's paper and Eunice Foote's paper was not included in the proceedings of the AAAS meeting, nor were they listed in the list of papers that were presented but not published. So they disappeared. And, and we don't know why they disappeared from, from those records. The two papers that uh, were written in 1856 by Eunice uh, Foote and, uh, um, and Elijah Foote did go on to be published. They were published in a journal known as the American Journal of Science and the Arts, uh, which continues as the American Journal of Science. Uh, this paper at the time was informally referred to as Silliman's Journal because the editors were, uh, were Silliman and Silliman, a father and son uh, team from, from Yale uh, University. And it was a well-respected journal. In fact, it wasn't uncommon for papers that were published in Silliman's journal to be um, found in other, uh, uh, found by other scientists and then republished in European journals. So one of the things that's kind of interesting uh, about this is if we read or look at the, the beginning of Eunice Foote's paper, uh, what we see whoops, is that uh, the title of Eunice Foote's paper was Circumstances Affecting the Heat of the Sun's Rays. But in the, the running head above her paper, what's listed is on the heat of the sun's rays, which is the title of Elijah Foote's paper. So it's possible that, that people might have seen that running head and mistaken uh, Eunice's paper as part of Elijah's. And in fact, that was sort of done in at least one case in the uh, European journal. And, uh, and it also gave me pause when I was, was doing the original research on this as well. So maybe that's part of what happened in terms of the confusion here. So here's a, uh, the reproduction of the article that came out in Scientific American, and it's entitled Scientific Ladies, Experiments with Condensed Gases. Now it, it talks about the research of many women in this, um, in this article, but the only one who did work with condensed gases was Eunice Foote. So this is clearly a shout out to, to Eunice Foote and the, uh, the work that she had done there. And uh, if we read through it, what I found really remarkable about this when we found this article. So the way I found this article was there was a, a contemporary uh, story about Eunice Foote that was written in the Smithsonian Magazine. And they mentioned this article that had been uh, conducted uh, that talked about how they praised her work, but they didn't look at the details of what the, the Scientific American article actually said. And so I sat down and read it and I was blown away by what we found out from it. And this is really exciting because this is contemporary to when Eunice Foote was doing her work. This was published just one month after her presentation by uh, Joseph Henry. And there, was, uh, there were several really key facts that came out about it. So one of them was the motivation for why she did this experiment. And in it, uh, what the, the writer from Scientific American states 
is that uh, this work was done, at least in part, to answer a question that was raised in a letter to Scientific American, in which um, a Mr. William Partridge was speculating on why temperatures were warmer in valleys than up at the top of mountains. And uh, so Eunice Foote had devised an experiment to test that. That's why she got her pump and pumped the air from one of the chambers into the second chamber so that she could simulate low uh, air condition at the top of mountains and compare it with higher air conditions at the bottom of mountains. So she couldn't accurately uh, explain the difference in, in pressure because she didn't have access to, uh, uh, to a pressure sensor. But she recognized that in the paper and talked about it and said that she had no means of, of estimating the difference in, in pressure within them. Uh, unfortunately, she probably uh, was not aware of the, uh, the ideal gas law, which she might have been able to use to, to get at uh, pressure in, in that way, but she makes no reference to it. So that was the first thing that I thought was really interesting about that paper. But the other is that it talks about uh, the geologic connections to Eunice Foote's uh, work. And in reading through the descriptions of the work that was being presented, at least in geology papers in the AAAS meeting, one of the things that struck me was that about half of the research that was being presented was in some way related to coal. Where were coal deposits found? How did coal form? Why was it um, so, uh, evasive, how, so pervasive? How do you grade coal? What's the process by which coal is preserved and so on? Right, And what was known of the, at the time was that coal was found everywhere uh, within the planet at low latitudes and at high latitudes. And this was, uh, was very perplexing to them because their understanding was that uh, the fossils that were found in the coal, the plant uh, leaf morphology and the types of, of fossils looked tropical to them. And so they concluded that coal must form in, in a warm, humid swamp conditions. And as such, they should be uh, relegated to only the tropical latitudes. And yet they were finding coal in, in Siberia and in, uh, in, uh, in Greenland and other high latitude environments. And so there was lots of speculation as to what might drive that. So possible explanations they came up with was that the earth was warmer in the past due to the escape of residual heat and, and gases from the interior of the earth as the earth was cooling from its formation, or that there were perhaps changes in the tilt of the earth's orbit that would explain the, um, the, uh, the coal deposits, or that the, uh, the earth itself was moving through warmer regions of space, or that there was continental drift, that maybe the continents weren't always at those high latitudes. And this was in, we found evidence uh, of this when we went through and read the, uh, the literature as early as the 1930s or 19, uh, sorry, 1830s or 1840s. Uh, so very much uh, earlier than the work that was done by, uh, by Alfred Begner or by uh, Milankovitch or Kroll, uh, whose work was in the, uh, the 1860s or, or later in terms of trying to understand what was driving changes in the Earth's climate. And so if we, uh, if we read through that, that statement uh, that's in there, this is uh, from the 1851 edition of Primitive Worlds, that, uh, that atlas that I, I mentioned to you. And he's describing what these conditions were like. And it says, small damp islands covered with forests inhabited by the greatest and most terrible monsters of the ancient world. Such are the scenes of, of which this formation offers to the artist, judging from the scientific researches already made. An atmosphere filled with humid vapors and exhalations of carbonic acid was as favorable to this prodigious propagation of the amphibious races as to the development of ferns, cycads, conifera, and uh, some monocotyledons. So he's talking about the types of, of uh, plants and animals that were found associated with the cold fauna. And right there, it says um, that there was speculation that carbonic acid vapor was, was present under these conditions, right? So this is one of the earliest uh, descriptions of CO2 in, in these ancient atmospheres. And so scientists who postulated that in the geologic past, there was residual heat that was escaping from the interior of the earth uh, were referred to as the, the plutonists, 
right, um, in terms of their, their position. And so here's the, the assessment that we put together from this was that Eunice Foote knew that geologists thought that carbonic acid gas was high in concentration during the Devonian um, and prior to the Carboniferous when the coal deposits were formed. And she knew that carbonic acid gas was also had been shown to be referred to as plant food, that plants were able to take it in. And they knew that from experiments in which they had placed um, plants in uh, vessels, uh, glass vessels with high concentrations of CO2 uh, that they formed by burning wood and that the plants grew from that. Uh, they also knew that if they put animals in those chambers, they would die. Uh, if they put an animal and a plant in it, they would survive. And so uh, we're able to work out the very fundamentals or, or observations of photosynthesis and respiration, even in the, the late 1700s, the early 1800s. And so uh, she reasoned that if there was more CO2 in the atmosphere based on the experiments that she saw, that that would have led to a warmer climate. And she states this in, in her paper in a few places. She says, the receiver containing the gas became itself much heated, and she's referring to carbonic acid gas, very sensibly more than the others. And on being removed from the sun, it was many, uh, many times as long in cooling. And then later, an atmosphere of that carbonic acid gas would give to our earth a high temperature. And if, as some suppose at one period in its history, the air had mixed with it a larger portion of that uh, at present, an increased temperature that was of its own action, as well as from the increased weight, uh, must have necessarily occurred. And so this is Eunice Foote's perspective of what drove changes in atmospheric temperature. It arose from, from two uh, issues. One was increasing the density of the atmosphere by putting more gas in it. And the second was uh, depending on the composition of the gas that was there. That's what she means by of its own action, because she saw that different gases had different effects. But unfortunately, she didn't pose uh, an explanation for why those different gases would have those different effects. Uh, had she been able to publish her, her papers and, and been encouraged to continue, maybe she would have. We won't know. But the, the second piece of information that uh, we took away from, from that Scientific American article was that they recognized this and, um, and were, uh, were able to explain what had happened there. And so they said, it's believed and taught by geologists that during the Devonian, the period preceding the Carboniferous era, when the coal beds uh, material were forming, that the atmosphere of the earth contained immense quantities of carbonic acid, uh, CO2, uh, my reference, and that there was a, a very elevated temperature of the atmosphere in existence in comparison with that of the present day. Those who believe uh, that this earth was once a fiery ball attribute this ancient great atmospheric heat to the elevated temperature of the earth. But Mrs. Foote, and they unfortunately spelled her name wrong, uh, experiments attribute it to a more rational cause and leave the pollutantness but a small foundation to stand upon for their theory. And so in their eyes, she had solved this problem that geologists were trying to understand that the reason why uh, temperatures were, were uh, sorry, why there was coal deposits and why coal was found all over the planet was because there was more CO2 in the atmosphere, which provided a warmer climate. And they were happy with that. They liked that explanation better than uh, it was residual heat ex uh, uh, that was escaping from the planet that was causing it to gradually cool with time, which is the, the alternative view. That's the so-called refrigeration hypothesis of the time is what they referred to it. So we now know that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has varied on Phanerozoic time scale. So the Phanerozoic is the last 500 uh, million years or so. This is from a recent paper by uh, Caitlin Witkowski and others in which they use the isotopic composition, a C13 isotopic composition of phytol and uh, foraminiferal calcite in order to make inferences of the amount of CO2 based on the magnitude of the isotopic shift between the inorganic and the organic um, compound that was generated. And what I find remarkable about this result is that it shows that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere over the last 500 million years has ranged from a low of about 200 parts per million to a high of about 2,000 parts per million. 
This is quite an important result because prior work done with geochemical modeling had concluded that um, the ancient CO2 levels might have been as high as 8,000 ppm. So this is quite a revision uh, from that and shows that we're actually uh, approaching the upper limit of, uh, of CO2 over a 500 million year time scale. Uh, the gray or the, the blue in this figure shows time periods of, of colder climate conditions. And so if we look at that in, in context of warming and clothing, cooling during the Devonian, we see that there was high CO2 during the Devonian, that period that we just talked about, and lower CO2 during the, uh, the Carboniferous, which is described as cold, but its conditions were perhaps not much colder than, than present pre-anthropogenic uh, conditions. So I mentioned that David Wells was aware of Eunice Foote's work. So he found her paper in uh, either in a, a newspaper article um, and then wrote up this summary. This is the entire summary that he wrote, which was found uh, years later by Sorensen and, uh, and republished in, in uh, 2011. And in it, he describes quite faithfully what it was that Eunice Foote had done, stating that she had uh, conducted this experiment with these glass tubes, put different gases in it, and saw that there were higher temperatures in the presence of, of carbonic acid and water vapor. The European journals of the time also picked this up a little bit uh, and provided summaries. And so uh, these are the entire summaries that have been republished in Roland Jackson's paper. So uh, it was republished twice in Jarsbrecht in 1856 and 1857, and then in New Philosophical Magazines in 1857. Elijah's paper from 1856 was also republished in full in Philosophical Magazine, but they didn't republish Eunice Foote's paper, even though it was on the next two pages of the journal. Now, what's intriguing about that is James Tyndale was one of the five editors of Philosophical Magazine at the time that that happened. He was not the, the managing editor, um, but it's, and it's not known whether uh, he saw it because he never wrote about uh, that paper. Um, but you could speculate that, that it's hard to imagine that he would have missed that paper when the other one was published right next to it. And so it was found again, or her work was found again in 155 years later by Ray Sorensen, who found that uh, summary from 1857 by David Wells. So the question becomes, why was Eunice Foote's work forgotten? And you know, maybe the, the simple answer is, is that uh, it was quite possibly forgotten because she was a woman. And at the time, uh, many men had the opinion that women were intellectually inferior to women. In fact, in, in Tyndale's writings, he, he states as much in, in quite a few cases, although there are times when he uh, expresses um, admiration for some women who he knew in, in, the, in the sciences or other fields. Uh, it's also true that um, Tyndale would uh, champion the cause of, of underdogs in, in many cases. And so Roland Jackson thinks that he just missed it. He didn't see it. Uh, we have no way of knowing uh, that for the fact or, or not. Uh, but what we do know is what two people who were clearly aware of her work stated about it. So one of them was, was Professor Joseph Henry. And here's the description from that. And after he finished reading Eunice Foote's paper, what he said was that uh, what she had done was, was uh, an experiments that were interesting and valuable, but there were many difficulties encompassing any attempt to interpret their significance. And, um, and he goes on to say that, um, as for Judge Foote's work, well, other people had done something like that previously. So his comments after the presentation of these two papers at the AAAS meeting was somewhat dismissive. He said, I don't, I don't understand what this means in one case. And in the other, he said, well, this is interesting, but other people have already shown this. Now he was the secretary of the uh, Smithsonian Institution and a high ranking uh, person in the AAAS. So one would think that if he said that this was not particularly interesting work, that that might explain why the, uh, the work was not published in the, the AAAS meeting, uh, meeting proceedings. The other thing that's interesting from this account is they make uh, direct reference to the fact that 
he referred to uh, Mrs. Eunice Foote during this, uh, this article. And so that implies that she may very well have been in the room when, uh, when her paper was read. The other uh, piece of work that we found that was interesting was from uh, David Wells. And so this is from his textbook. And recall that the article in Scientific American said that geologists are taught this information. So when I read that, I said, I really wanna see what those textbooks from the 1800s look like. And uh, looked up those uh, textbooks to find them, starting with ones from the 1830s up through the 1850s and came across this textbook by uh, Joseph Wells. And so this was written in 1861, a couple of years after Eunice Foote's work. And in it, he talks about the questions that we've already addressed here today. The, uh, uh, the fact that um, uh, some scientists thought that there was high CO2 in the, in the atmosphere, and that that was one of the explanations for why there was coal at high latitudes. But he goes on to say in the latter part of that quote, that he didn't think that this had uh, any temperature effect on uh, what had occurred there. And so uh, David Wells makes reference to uh, Eunice Foote's work, but he doesn't cite her directly. Even though in other parts in his textbook, he goes out of his way to cite male scientists by name um, and reputation. So he disregarded Eunice's uh, work, sort of presented it as if it was known fact, um, and then took issue with her conclusion that the presence of CO2 in, in, the, in the vessels would have uh, resulted in warming. So he just didn't believe it, or he wasn't convinced by it, at the very least. Um, and that um, is the, the other point that comes out about uh, perhaps why her work was, was uh, not taken seriously or was dismissed. And so as a, a final summary plot, this is from our paper that shows the, the ranking of the temperature differences for uh, each of these cases. We've uh, taken a, a difference between the, the, the sunlit and the shaded, and then a second difference relative to the common air run and show that uh, the, the dry air was uh, about the same in temperature. The condensed air run was warmer than the, uh, the common air run and the water vapor and CO2 uh, runs uh, were both warmer as well, which was the third uh, result that Eunice Foote had come to. And so in summary, um, what we see is that, that Eunice Foote was the first to experimentally demonstrate that CO2 and water vapor would warm uh, air in the presence of, of sunlight to a greater degree than, uh, than was observed with, uh, with standard air or with, uh, with a vacuum. Um, and she, she was motivated to do this study in order to understand why uh, temperatures were warmer in valleys than at the top of mountains. Uh, but because she was a careful scientist and had looked at uh, the composition of air as a, a potential factor, she was also able to differentiate the role of vacuum versus pressure as well as compositional changes in air. Now she did not discover the greenhouse effect per se, uh, because her mechanism is different from the, uh, from the greenhouse effect, but she certainly uh, measured the molecular effect of uh, the greenhouse effect uh, for the first time, uh, for the, the molecular effect of greenhouse gases for the first time. Uh, but unfortunately, her work was, was not uh, remembered or taken seriously at the time, uh, but probably because of societal norms that, uh, that held that, uh, that women were not the intellectual uh, match for men. In, in their day, uh, or that just discounted um, American science as not as sophisticated as European science. And so what, what this tells me is that we really should be looking very broadly to, um, to who is doing the science and taking seriously their contribution because you may overlook a fact that turns out to be uh, strikingly important as we've seen from, from her work uh, 155 years ago. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Very good. Thank you very much, Joe. You. So um, now is the time for questions. The mechanics of this are a little awkward because uh, we had to use Harsh's laptop for the presentation. And so the chat function isn't something that uh, 
my dear colleague was able to monitor. So, um, Harsh, do you want to come by and? Yep. Uh, so if uh, if there's anyone from the the audience uh, from the zoom audience who would like to ask a question please feel free to unmute yourself and and ask away and we'll alternate with questions from the room as well yes we have a question from the room that's a great question Can you repeat so the, the, the question is, does Eunice Foote's experimental apparatus still uh, exist? And uh, the answer to that is, uh, we don't know. It's not been found. Um, but since she lived in upstate New York, one of the things that I did was reach out to the Corning uh, Glass uh, fa Factory and, and Museum and looked at their, um, their early ro rosters to try and see if we could find evidence that they had manufactured them for her. Unfortunately, we did not find that, but we did find recipes for, for glass from the 1850s. So we have a, a general understanding of, of what was put into scientific glass at that time. It's a great question. Any other local questions? Uh, yeah. So I was wondering if, uh, if you know anything about her subsequent career. Uh, you know, that's that's so that uh, the question is does anyone know anything about uh Eunice Foote's um later career what she did and and are there perhaps other papers that have not been found yet uh, that's a really intriguing idea and one of the things that's interesting about her second paper is she states in the second paper that she was working on a third but that third paper has never been found. Um, as far as what she did after these, these two publications is she, uh, she continued with her work in, in women's rights and um, focused more of her energy on, uh, on her, uh, uh, her work as an inventor and uh, created those, uh, those inventions that, uh, that I mentioned afterwards. Can you go back to the, the comment that Joseph <coughs> Yes. So, I mean, that strikes me as a reasonable thing to say. Uh, any difficulty encompassing any attempt at interpretation? Is that not a fair assessment given the state of scientific knowledge at the time? It's perhaps a fair Could you again repeat? So, so the question is well, maybe. You know, um, Joseph Henry, maybe we're, we're giving him too bad a rap here. And maybe what he was saying there was, was a, a, an appropriate statement for, our, for that time period. It, it's possible to interpret it that way. One could, um, could take the position that, uh, that Eunice Foote was just way ahead of her time and doing research that, that others uh, weren't ready to appreciate. Um, I think the counter to that is James Tyndale, three years later, publishes his work and findings on uh, the greenhouse effect and is lauded as a champion for, uh, for his understanding. Um, in addition to that, um, Henry clearly knew Eunice Foote. He had presented this work uh, twice uh, at two different meetings. Um, presumably they had corresponded. Um, he could have encouraged her to work on this stuff. In fact, when he presented the second paper one of the things that he said was that, well, this is a really interesting experiment that she's done. And in fact, I thought about doing something similar to it, but, but didn't quite get as far along. Uh, but if anyone was gonna champion Eunice Foote, it was gonna be Henry or perhaps David Ames Wells, um, but, but they didn't do that. Well, but, I mean, he read the papers, but he didn't have to do that. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, like why, if he, if he 
Well, we don't we don't know all the the details, um, you know, behind that or or related to it. We do know that other women had had their work read before uh, by other scientists. So um, Agassiz had read uh, a work on uh, locusts several years earlier by a woman scientist who never published uh, the work. Um, I guess what I'm saying is in the, in the uh, uh, the results coming out of this, it's clear that he didn't think they were very interesting, or that they weren't interpretable, um, and so didn't you know press the uh, the position to to deal with that. What I find fascinating is the fact that the decision was made not to publish them in the AAAS proceedings. Had these papers been published in the AAAS proceedings, they might have been picked up with uh, uh, with more interest in, in Europe. Um, and she might have at that point uh, received uh, direct attention from Tyndale or others uh, to either encourage or at least cite the, the work that she had done. Okay, so maybe, maybe if you're, when you keep saying interpret this, you can read them as saying something like whether they're important. It sounds to me like he's saying interpret, like it's hard to know what they mean. Yeah, that's true. Can you, and it, um, so, so the question is, is how do we interpret significance? Um, uh, and and um, what the, uh, uh, the, the questioner is asking is whether I'm um, speculating as to whether he thought they were significant, meaning important, or whether he just understood them. And you're absolutely right. In fact, in the notes and record paper, we do state that those two possibilities, that it's possible that he simply didn't understand what they meant and didn't know what to do with it. Um, which is possible, it wasn't his particular field of study, um, or alternatively that he just didn't think it was important. Um, but certainly uh, we may never know what happened. Unfortunately, many of the early papers from this time period and notes from uh, the Smithsonian Institution were lost in a fire. So we can't really follow up on a lot of the correspondence. It's possible that there may be some information there um, I think it would be very interesting to see if, um, if they had written to any of the European journals requesting that their paper be uh, republished. Um, one of the things I was hoping we might be able to find would be a rejection letter, right? Or comments about why the, the papers were not accepted directly. So this is somewhat speculative, uh, but it's the, the, the best information we have based on um, uh, Secondhand accounts or firsthand accounts from people who had actually been in the room when the, the science was read. Yeah, it looked to me like the, the questions in the Zoom chat were, were logistical. Well, these are great questions. I, I appreciate the, the feedback and interest. And there's, there's another as well. All right. Uh, so please, uh, thank you so much for this insightful presentation. I think it's been very fascinating. Um, in the beginning, I saw how you started and raised the trend of uh, vision of the unborn side. So I believe um, in this uh, experiment, was there any kind of uh, maybe paper that takes like you know relates our uh, experiments based on uh, natural vision and rather than clinical vision? Because um, it was based on her work that she actually started experiment or what to make us to understand the mission of her so called that is that with an increase. I'm wondering that after a period of time, with current technology, study through carbon sequestration and rejection of carbon to the subsurface, what are greenhouse gases could also be more experimental in absorbing the radiation. So my question comes in this manner. Have there been any form of uh, impact that tends to like establish uh, the, the relationship of what's really started based on the natural forces of what's actually driving the CO2 to the atmosphere and the anthropogenic forces also driving the CO2 to the atmosphere. Yeah, so the, the question is whether there have been um, direct measurements of the relationship between um, 
greenhouse uh, emissions and radiative forcing response? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, they're referred to as attribution studies, and they've been done in a number of different ways um, through uh, the use of uh, uh, radiative transfer uh, function equations looking at uh, absorption of, uh, of um, radiant energy uh, in response to differences in the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That's a great question. In the second question, I believe during the pandemic situation, really scoring is fine. If you look at uh, the current uh, record on the physical mental file of climate change, you know, there are five graphical calls that have been established showing that there is a drop in carbon emission because uh, the pandemic has kind of isolated the record. So, given that kind of scenario that we have in this situation, uh, at some point in time, there is a decline in the emission of carbon. And also, I believe in the 1800, during the pandemic time, when there was kind of disease everywhere, there was also a drop. Do you kind of have that kind of projection that if we have this kind of consistent scenario, there is going to be a kind of a drop in carbon emission? And if it is, then how will the least uh, theory or principle, you know, continue to be? What yeah, so the, the question is, if we uh, reduce CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, will there be a, a resulting drop in, um, in warming, right, in the warming response? And the answer to that is yes. Um, and so there's, there's a couple of people's research that you could look to that have talked about that. One of them is uh, uh, Michael Mann who has, has done some calculations that um, address that, or a, a more historical example would be Bill Ruddeman. So uh, Bill Ruddeman is a paleoclimatologist and he's my academic grandfather. So he was my advisor's advisor. And, um, and he writes in his, uh, his book on um, uh, the delayed glaciation hypothesis, that you can look at time periods when human populations in the past decreased, um, such as during the, um, uh, the Roman uh, plagues or the Black Death that the, um, uh, the warming of the planet uh, decreased and there was a measurable response in CO2 uh, emissions or uh, productions. At that point, it would have been um, agricultural uh, related, for example. So thank you very much. Okay, in view of the hour, I think we should probably terminate the questions and thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm honored to be uh, welcomed here as the, the inaugural speaker for your, your series.